Hello, and welcome back to ThoughtBat. In today's video, I aim to present my case for egoism, as I would say that egoism is the fundamental philosophical position from which my political stances follow. To begin my argument, I will discuss the meaning of egoism, and then I will explain why I think it plays an important role in not just anti-capitalist movements, but also struggles against sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and hierarchical ideologies in general. For the context of this video, I will use the term egoism in reference to a system of ethics based on the prioritisation of one's own self-interest. This definition may include one of the three main types of egoism, rational, ethical and psychological, but I will be focusing on the latter two as they are the most relevant to my argument. Ethical egoism is simply the premise that you should be egoistic, and psychological egoism is that all actions are inherently egoistic to some degree. A common objection to the combination of these two strains of egoism is that if all actions are egoistic, then any standard of ethics based on the premise that we should act in our own self-interest is void. As I will explain in this video, however, this is not the case. Perhaps the most famous egoist, Max Stirner, whose name has been resurrected by 21st century meme culture, laid out his own case for egoism in his 1844 publication titled The Ego in Its Own, link in description. In this book, Stirner questions the necessity for individuals to devote themselves to a range of causes, i.e. the cause of God, the cause of a nation, the cause of humanity, etc. Stenner exclaims that, to be considered a truly moral, righteous and worthy being, we must choose one of these causes to dedicate ourselves to, just so long it's not one of our own causes that we are striving for. To cut a long story short, Stenner reminds us that these entities known as church, state and humanity are not at all present in material reality, but are merely abstract concepts which are actually just referring to a collection of individuals claiming to represent such entities. For example, to carry out the word of God is to carry out the word of bishops. To devote oneself to furthering the national interest is to devote oneself to the interests of government bureaucrats, and to strive for the cause of humanity is simply to strive for the cause of whoever claims to represent those interests, as well as their collaborators and beneficiaries. From this realisation we see that, at the end of the day, the devotion to this cause or that cause necessarily creates an intellectual and ethical hierarchy between the self-proclaimed representatives of an abstraction over the believers in the divinity of said abstraction. You'll notice that those higher up on the hierarchy will live a life of egoism, where the desires are satisfied and the demands are met, whilst reminding their servants not to be egoists themselves. Sterner also highlighted that critics of egoism are necessarily hypocritical, as those critics are necessarily egoists themselves. All actions are egoistic to some degree. This is because, in order to act, one must make a value judgement, as value is the affinity to act in order to attain or preserve some objective. We therefore necessarily act according to our own value judgments, whether they be rational or otherwise, and so it follows that sacrifice, which is giving up a higher value in exchange for a lesser value, is impossible. Acts of compassion, such as giving food to a stranger, is from a result of valuing the stranger's health more than the result of eating the food yourself. Because action is a result of your value judgments, the actions you take are still for your own sake. This doesn't, however, render the concept of ethical egoism void. Sterner claimed that the people who don't subscribe to egoism are merely unconscious egoists. They believe that they are ultimately acting for the good of something other than themselves, but they're not aware that they're still acting according to their own value judgments. Loyal servants value, perhaps irrationally, the preservation of some power structure and the emulation of a supposed ideal citizen over what they believe to be the consequences for not doing so, even if it just be the negative feeling as a result of acting immorally. When people become conscious of their egoism, ethical standards based on maximising one's own pursuit of their own self-interest now become helpful. The hypothetical imperatives related to how one can live a valuable life will be discussed in greater detail in a future video. In a tame society, as Foucault explains, the moral standards of the ruling classes are propagated by the media and education, and reinforced by the arm of the state. The rulers therefore present themselves to the masses as the ideal persons, uh, people who should be admired at all times. In a capitalist economy, the individualistic, innovative and risk-taking business-oriented character of the entrepreneur is lionised by society. It is fully within the interests of the powerful, especially in a liberal democracy, to be admired and adored as opposed to being resented. These idealisms of the ruling classes become socialised and cultivated into the minds of the masses, a means by which Gary Chartier calls ideological colonisation. In this process, people, perhaps through a sense of belonging, begin to identify with those in power, and therefore adopt the ideology which best suits the powerful. We see this in its most obvious form when working class conservatives feel personally attacked by the suggestion of the abolition of private property, despite the fact they don't own any property themselves. Indeed, this is all to secure the rulers' positions of power, 
It is fully within their self-interest to continue this process of ideological colonization, but they are presented as merely striving to be good moral individuals who everyone should emulate. Of course, this shroud hasn't been entirely successful. Many people throughout history have been able to expose the selfishness of their masters. In their response to the, the discovery of their masters' egoism, they denounce it. They declare that no one shall be an egoist, as the egoism of their masters has led to their own indignation. Surely then, the failure to stamp out egoism out of society will only lead to the reproduction of such oppression. And so, they establish a counter-morality, one which celebrates altruism and selflessness, one which establishes a community spirit for the sake of the community, one which ensures that each person is doing their bit for the new ideal so long as the defining features of the new morality is the opposite of those of the old. Whilst this phenomenon is not necessarily obvious, explicit or even conscious in revolutionary movements, Stirner wasn't the only philosopher to notice it. Friedrich Nietzsche labelled the two opposing moralities as Meister morale and Sklaven morale, whereby, out of resent for one another, the masses and the slaves formulate, reproduce and develop opposing ethical codes which justify their will to power, and, I would add, their pursuit of material interests which are in conflict with the other class. The Marxist among my audience will find the last sentence familiar, but I will get round to Marxism shortly. Stirner, exclaiming that he is already opposed to the next revolution, believed that these revolutionaries were wrong to blame the egoism of their masters for their subordination. This error leads people to merely replace one divine all-powerful abstraction with yet another divine all-powerful abstraction, thus recreating the hierarchy of the representatives of the abstraction over the believers. On the contrary, Stirner blames their lack of conscious egoism and their devotion to causes which are supposed to be higher than their own. For Stirner, if the working class became conscious of the materialistic necessity of their labour, or the lack thereof of the owning class, and began to advocate in their own self-interest instead of those of bosses, landlords and priests and politicians, nothing would withstand their will to power. It is a mere question of raising class consciousness and engaging in practices to build counter hegemony in order to resist and challenge the established order. A strong critic of Stirner's egoism was of course Karl Marx himself. In fact, a large part of Marx's The German Ideology, which was dedicated to ridiculing Stirner's philosophy, has kept alive Stirner's claim to fame since the 1930s. Whilst they were both materialist philosophers, Stirner's was by far the more radical, as he had no time for the establishment of abstractions such as the dictatorship of the proletariat entrusted with managing the revolution towards a distant, idealised society. A good video to help explain this difference would be The Materialism of Stirner and Marx by Octopus Circus, which I will link in the description below. In fact, you should check out the stuff Octopus Circus has made on Stirner, as he's got some good informative videos on the subject. Now back to the topic. For the anarchist movement in general, analysing social structures through a dialectical materialist lens alone doesn't answer important questions regarding the interests and the livelihoods of the people who are to be viewed as a means to an end. The spectre of communism, i.e. the collectivist pursuit of a perfect humanity, becomes yet another replacement for God, the nation and the liberal morality. Uh, as I said in my introduction, egoism isn't just relevant to anti-capitalism and anti-statism. The anarcho-feminist Emma Goldman took influence from the works of Stirner and perhaps more surprisingly Nietzsche and applied their analysis of power structures to that of patriarchy. Feminism is founded on the opposition to the notion that women exist for the benefit of men and instead proposes that a woman's life is to be lived and her body is to be used for her own ends. The similarity between this and the egoist maxim that an individual's life is to be lived and their body is to be used for their own ends is striking. From these premises, it is easy to see how a cascade of feminist and egoist positions on bodily autonomy, gender roles, stereotypes and anti-patriarchal sentiments necessarily follow in harmony with one another. The same could be said for anti-racism, as the concept of whiteness is yet another abstraction used to marginalise minority groups and their cultures. It is fully within the interests of women and minorities to engage in anti-patriarchal and anti-racist politics. As a member of the LGBT community myself, disassembling the heteronormativity and homophobia is also in my best self-interest. An anarchist society made up of consciously self-interested individuals must found its social economic structures on the appeal to mutual self-interest and remain critical of seemingly self-justifying abstractions which may hinder such mutuality. This leads us to anarchism as not even the monopoly of force is compatible with an equal society because in order to maintain a monopoly of force it requires a state to coerce its subjects into recognising its authority above all. To conclude, egoism inverts the hierarchy between individual and the abstract. Abstractions are to ever be scrutinised according to how they help the individual live a good life, instead of having the individual be assessed according to how they can fit into an idealist standard of how one should be. From this inversion comes a collapse of the essentialist justifications for power structures, as they too are abstractions. Now we are intellectually free to conceive a medium of cooperation and socialisation which facilitates the pursuit of mutual self-interest, we can begin to discuss what such a medium may look like. 
I've already begun this discussion in my video titled Why is Property, so I recommend you check that out. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. If so, give it a like and hit the subscribe button. In the meanwhile, be sure to follow me on Twitter, at ThoughtBat, and join the Batcave, my all new Discord server, set up as a space to discuss my content, share memes, relevant literature, and perhaps most importantly, signal booster content, channels, organisations, etc. that you feel other leftists should be aware of. Yes, this does include your own. The link is in the description below. For now though, that's all from me. I'll see you in the next one. Ta-ta.